Welcome to First Christian Church. We are glad to welcome you to this online worship experience, and we're glad that you can be here today. Uh, Terry Minton will be joining us as our guest minister. Terry is a member of First Christian Church and an integral leader within the life of our church. Uh, prior to his career in the healthcare field, uh, Terry served as an ordained minister for over 20 years. And so we are grateful that he is able and willing to share those gifts with us today. I invite you to join with me as we go to God in prayer. Good and holy God, we are blessed once again to be in worship as a community, to take another step together in faith, and to deepen our understanding as the body of Christ. Yet we are separated physically, and this is painful, and it can be painful. Some of us are lonely, lonely. some of us are grieving, some of us are just plain tired. We pray for your comfort during these times, and we pray that we can be present for those who feel the same pain. God, we ask that you equip us to be bearers of your peace. Help us meet the needs of a hurting world without falling into hopelessness and cynicism. Give us what we need to be your hands and feet in this world. We pray this in your son's name, just as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. man who was quite distressed over the prospect of not being able to take his riches with him when he died. So before he died, he loaded his briefcase with two gold bars from his private vault and left instructions to have the case locked with the key. He handcuffed it to his wrist and the key placed into his grave clothes. His family carried out his orders correctly to the letter. 
When he appeared at the pearly gates, he had the briefcase with him, key in hand. St. Peter asked, what do you have in your suitcase? Very proudly, the man unlocked the case, opened it, and displayed his two gold bars. St. Peter said, isn't that special? You brought pavement. What we treasure and hold onto here on earth is may not be that important. Now is the time to give back to the Lord. Please give as you are able. It was almost time for the 11 o'clock service at the church where I was pastoring. On this particular Sunday, we were going to baptize three adults at the very beginning of the service. So I made my way to the dressing room behind the baptistry. I pulled my robe out of the closet and then my fisherman's waders. Yes, that's the secret of how we stay dry. I rolled up my sleeves and my pant legs so they wouldn't get wrinkled and got into the waders and then the robe. I made my, my way into the baptistry and everything went very smoothly. I came back into the dressing room, took off my robe, the waders, put my suit jacket on, and made my way around the back of the auditorium in a side door and was able to make it to the platform while the first song was still being sung. I was going to go to the pulpit after the song and offer the morning's invocation. Close to the end of the song, my associate standing next to me reaches over and tugs on my sleeve and says, Your pants! I knew at that very moment that I'd forgotten to roll down my pant legs. So I'm standing there with my hymnal singing away, with my pant legs rolled up to my knees, knowing, though, that being cool, calm, and collected, I would make my way to the pulpit, and when I asked people to pray, I would reach down and roll down my pant legs. Little did I know that that morning there were some would-be heroes in the crowd. When I asked everyone to pray, you could see my, if you had an overhead view, you would see my associate coming across the platform from the other side, crawling across the platform to roll down my pant legs. The sound man in the balcony was hanging his leg over the edge, pointing at it, trying to get my attention. There were people in the choir going, psst, psst. Well, I pretended nothing was wrong. Went through the whole morning knowing that everyone there knew what had happened, and I knew. We do that sometimes when we're going to be embarrassed or we feel a little bit awkward, but we also do it in more serious moments of life when we're experiencing sort of the shadows, those shadow moments of life. For some reason, we pretend that no one knows, but they do. We act like we're not even aware, but we are. In 1998, Tori Murden set out from Nags Head, North Carolina, on her boat, the American Pearl, to try to row across the Atlantic solo, being the first woman to accomplish this task. She had made it almost 85 days close to the end of the journey when Hurricane Danielle intersected her path. The raging winds and huge waves began to beat against her boat, and eventually her boat was flipped end over end nine times. She found herself still at the bottom of the cabin of the boat, and this is what she says. Helplessness was sitting beside me. My spirit shrank like a leaky balloon. Helplessness had me by the throat, and there was no escape. Do you know that kind of heartache, that kind of desperation that casts shadows across your life? The dictionary defines a shadow as when light is interrupted and the shadow takes the shape of the object casting it. Well, shadows can be playful. There are times when I've stood on a sidewalk with my arms outstretched and asked my granddaughter, Jump into T Dad's shadow. Jump into T Dad's shadow. Or those times when your children are small and you put your hands in front of the wall trying to make animal shapes, hoping that they can guess what they are. Playful at times, yes, but shadows also can be very serious in our lives. Over the past year, the pandemic has ravaged our world and particularly our country. There's been horrible illness 
way too many deaths. There have been lost jobs and incredible hardships. The election politics and ideological warfare has fueled conflict around the country and around the globe. Belief in ourselves, belief in each other, belief in our way of life have given rise to uncertainty. We are living under a shadow. No, we are living under shadows, plural. They're in the shape of grief, in the shape of conflict, in the shape of doubt. Tori Murden talks about the grueling effort to row across the Atlantic. 1,800 oar strokes per hour, 12 hours a day, more than 80 days, more than 3,000 miles, grueling and demanding. Living life can be that kind of grueling struggle, never-ending, day by day, mile by mile. We're unable to edge out of the shadows and into the light. One of the most challenging is the shadow of grief. It's that natural reaction to loss. We've lost a loved one or someone that's very special to us. Recently, when President Biden was on the eve of his inauguration, he hosted a memorial service in honor of those more than 400,000 people who have died in America as a result of COVID-19. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, husbands and wives, family members, friends. Perhaps you've lost someone to COVID, if not in other circumstances during your life. You know the shadow in the shape of grief. Perhaps you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, the Christian author who wrote The Chronicles of Narnia for children. He also wrote Mere Christianity and many other works. Lewis was a tenured professor at Oxford and Cambridge at the same time. J.R.R. Tolkien was one of his colleagues. In fact, it was Tolkien who, with his intellectual arguments and his challenges of Lewis, led Lewis to convert to Christianity at the age of 33. Lewis didn't get married until later in life. It was when he was 58. He married Joy Davidson, but they would have only four years together before she passed away from cancer. Lewis wrote shortly thereafter a book called A Grief Observed. He wrote it under a pseudonym so no one would know he was the author. In it's ironic that many of his colleagues bought that book for him to give to him to be helpful. One of his descriptions of grief has stuck with me. He said this, No one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness. I keep on swallowing. Helplessness grips you by the throat. In some of the first descriptions of Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 5, is early on in his ministry, and people were beginning to follow him around, and he would stop on occasion and teach. On this particular day, he stopped on a hillside, and there were thousands present. And he began to share, trying to show the, the contrast between his teachings and those of traditional Jewish faith. His first words showed a radical departure from those traditional views. He said that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those without spiritual pedigree. He said that those who would ultimately own the earth were the meek, not the kings and the privileged few. And then a very powerful statement he looked at the crowd and he said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They would have comforting of the soul for their heartbreaking loss. Comfort comes in many forms. Sometimes we find a comfort when we just recognize a particular habit or tradition that reminds us of the loved one we're missing. Maybe it's words that are shared at a holiday or lyrics of a song or a poem there was an event in Jesus' life that depicts his own encounter with grief and with comfort. From all descriptions, it looks like Mary and Martha and Lazarus 
were some of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus was off teaching along with the disciples when they received word that Lazarus was very, very ill. They encouraged him to leave and go to Lazarus, but Jesus said, no, no, we're doing what's important right here. We're going to stay here and finish our task. It wasn't long before they received word that Lazarus had, in fact, passed away. So Jesus, along with the disciples, headed to visit Mary and Martha. The Bible tells us this is what happened next. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. There it is. The moment Jesus felt like you feel. Scholars have argued why it is that Jesus was weeping when he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus shortly thereafter. Well, Jesus wept with Mary and Martha. He wept for Mary and Martha. And he wept for Lazarus. There are people who occasionally will mention someone that they've lost to death and will wonder why they continue to grieve and feel awkward at times and feel the missing of that loved one so deeply. Well, remember, Jesus wept. And he can break the grip of helplessness and move you from the shadow of grief into the light of God's love. Grief that we've talked about is often triggered, as I mentioned, by an event of loss. But there's one shadow that can be sort of ever-present and pervasive in our experience, and that's the shadow of conflict. We talked earlier about the turmoil in the world and in America and the conflicts between families and, and communities and pol political powers. Conflict isn't something that's new to us. We often experience conflict in the shape of broken relationships in families, in the shape of failed friendships, or the shape of chaotic communities. It's part of the human condition. The shadow of conflict can penetrate the smallest spaces of our experience. It can permeate the emotional air that we breathe. Throughout history, there have been stories of family conflicts. We can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and find stories of conflict among families and people and we've known conflicts among husbands and wives, parents and children, extended family and, and friends. Every family has their own stories. I do. You probably have your own as well. Even recently I read about families in conflict and those family members in the midst of the political turmoil and the pandemic have even elected not to speak to some family members at the risk of conflicts exploding in these tense times. Family conflicts have been the subject of jokes, the foundation of cliches and, and storylines in books and movies and television. Many of us are old enough to have watched All in the Family or Dallas, and more recently, The Crown. We watch those shows not because our lives are similar in status or in those specific experiences, but we recognize the family conflicts and the challenges. Maybe it's comforting to know that we're not alone. Similar to family relationships are friendships. There's a saying that says that, that friends are the family you choose. My wife and I have been privileged to have the joy of that kind of friend family. People that we've chosen to invest our lives with and the joy that comes from that. However, we know that, that those kind of friendships can also devolve into conflict and struggle. Occasionally, there are flickers of light, but the, the shadow of conflict can be very, very stubborn. Jesus had something to say, some difficult things to say about interpersonal conflict. It was in Matthew chapter 6, after he had finished telling us how to go about praying, that Jesus said these words, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Let's go back to English class for a moment. This is a conditional sentence. If you do this, then you will get this. 
Well, the then part is something we're very concerned about. We want God's forgiveness. But he tells us that when we seek his love and forgiveness, he compels us to forgive others. There's no simple formula. Toward the end of his last days with the disciples, Jesus gathered them around and he spent some time teaching them and sort of giving them a heads up about what to expect. More than twice during these encounters, he said these words, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. In the midst of conflicts, I need to ask myself, if I love them as Jesus loves them, what should I do? Friend and family relationships are difficult, but those conflicts in community are very challenging. Conflicts with those with different beliefs, different political persuasions, different backgrounds. How do we begin to move forward to a better way? How do we apply Jesus' commandment in such circumstances? I can't prescribe a specific process, but we should start with loving them as Christ loves us and loves them. I recently discovered a, a good starting point for resolving conflict. I ran across a woman on the web named Sharon McMahon. She's a former government teacher and has become sort of a go-to person on the web to fact-check information about the Constitution and our governmental functions. But in her discussions of the conflict of this last year, she said these words, Listening to understand does not obligate you to agree. Let me say it again. Listening to understand does not obligate you to agree. This is a great starting point. It's a starting point in marriages and children and parent relationships with friends and community. Listening to understand can break the grip of helplessness and move us out of the shadow of conflict and into the light of peace and reconciliation. Grief and conflict are large shadows. They have long-lasting effects. But these can also trigger another shadow that undermines our resolve to keep rowing, to keep going. It's the shadow of doubt. And it often comes in the shape of personal failures or the shape of a failed belief system. We can thank the Apostle Paul for examples of both of these. In chapter 7 of Romans, Paul describes his personal struggles and the personal failures that he's frustrated about. He says that I do the things I don't want to do, and I can't find a way to do the things I want to do. He's frustrated, and eventually in this chapter he cries out, who will deliver me from this body of death? In the early Roman Empire, it was a practice to punish a murderer by strapping the body of the victim to the murderer's body to drag around for days. This is the image that Paul is calling forth. This body of death, who can, who can rescue me from this sense of personal failure? And he cries out and it says, we are rescued by Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul demonstrates that it's when we accept our humanity that we experience the love of Christ. Sometimes perhaps the person you most need to offer grace and understanding is yourself. Whether well, doubt from personal failures, and they can throw the boat off balance, but there remains another catalyst for doubt that can complicate everything. It's the doubt from a failed belief system. The doubt from particular beliefs about God and faith and ultimate truth. Often that doubt comes as a result of experiences in life that, that contradict what we believe and what we thought to be true. Let's take a look at Paul again. As a Pharisee and a leader of the Jewish people, he was highly respected. He was spending his time killing Christ followers. As a Pharisee, he also was a believer in the afterlife and the resurrection that would come with Messiah bringing the kingdom into the Roman Empire. He was killing Christ followers knowing that Jesus had been unceremoniously killed and Surely it was only a matter of time before the rest of the followers 
just dispersed. Paul was on his way to Damascus and he encountered Jesus Christ. But that can't be. Jesus is dead. But he's not. In that moment, Paul experienced the truth that contradicted all of his beliefs. And seeing Jesus, he knew that Jesus was resurrected. And if Jesus is resurrected, Jesus is Messiah. Paul spent some time unraveling his old belief system and trying to shape new beliefs around what he had come to know to be true. I don't know what your Damascus Road experience is. If it's some kind of life challenge that has confronted your beliefs and you've found them unable to explain what's going on. Perhaps it's a relationship that has gone astray and it doesn't fit with how you see life and an ultimate truth. Doubts are stubborn. The shadows they cast can breed helplessness and helplessness grabs you by the throat. Through Paul we understand that it's through grace and patience and encouragement and they can break the hold of doubt. Tori Murden lay on the floor of the small cabin in the grip of helplessness. She surrendered, ultimately turning on her emergency beacon, and she was rescued by a ship called the Independent Spirit. Exactly one year from the day of sailing into Philadelphia Harbor on the Independent Spirit, Tori Murden struck out alone again in the American Pearl to accomplish rowing solo across the Atlantic to be the first woman to accomplish that task. 1,800 oar strokes per hour, 12 hours a day. Again, more than 80 days, more than 3,000 miles, and she eventually rode out of the shadows and on to the sunlit shores of terra firma. The journey's hard. The shadows seem like they'll linger forever. But I assure you that God is faithful. God loves you and me. The Bible tells us this. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Maybe your shadow is in the shape of grief, in the shape of conflict, or in the shape of doubt. Take up an oar and row out of the shadows and into the light of Christ. Amen.
It was the last hours before Jesus would be betrayed. He gathered with his disciples in a small room to enjoy a meal, a special meal that they were all familiar with. Sometime during the meal, Jesus stopped everyone from talking and reached out and grabbed the bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, he reached out and grabbed the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you eat of this and drink of this cup, remember me. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the joy and the privilege of this table. A table to which you welcome each one of us freely and openly. The gift of your love, the gift of your sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Help us maintain a sense of your presence in our day-to-day experience, knowing that we have experienced the broken body of Christ and the blood of of his sacrifice that makes all the difference. In Jesus' name, amen. This table is open to all because these are the gifts of God for the people of God. so glad to have spent this time of worship with you. If you would like someone to pray with you, we have our staff, Stephen ministers, and elders on standby to take your call to pray with you. If you're feeling called to join this body of worship, this church, uh, feel free to contact one of our staff, Stephen ministers, or elders, and they can walk you through that process. We would love to have you join our faith family. Now, as you go on your way this day, Know that the power, peace, and presence of Christ is always with you. Amen.